our grand round speaker. Um, so without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so Dr. Leslie Ann Diedrich is an attending physician in the Division of Neonatology in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. She's originally from San Antonio and completed her medical training at the UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas and her pediatric residency at Phoenix Children's Hospital Maricopa Medical Center. She subsequently worked as a neonatal hospitalist at the Phoenix Children's Hospital and then returned to San Antonio to complete her neonatal perinatal medicine fellowship and thereafter joined us as faculty. She's now an assistant program director of the Neurodevelopmental Follow-Up Clinic, the premier program, and the director of the Infant Feeding Support Program in the NICU. She is a cert certified in the Advanced Basic Prectal General Movement Assessment, the Hammersmith Infant Neurologic Exam, and the Hammersmith Neonatal Neurological Exam. Her research interests include implementation of early cerebral palsy detection and interventions in the NICU and follow-up program, and lactation support for high-risk mother-infant diets, characterization of feeding patterns in infants with complex medical conditions. Her talk today is Making Sense of Movement, Detecting Cerebral Palsy in the First Year. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Diedrich. Good morning. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Hansen, and thank you all for having me here um, to discuss this topic. So um, the overview for my talk today is to first define cerebral palsy and the different types. And then we'll dive into the recommendations for early diagnosis of CP, and then look at two of the main tools that we use, which are Prechtel's General Movement Assessment, uh, known as the GMA, and the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Exam, known as the HINE. And then I'll show you how we have been applying um, these tools in our neurodevelopmental follow-through program and taking it to the NICU. And then we'll briefly look at some of the future directions for early diagnosis of cerebral palsy. So let's start off by defining cerebral palsy. It is a group of permanent disorders of movement and posture causing limitations on activity that are due importantly to a non-progressive type of disturbance in the developing fetal or immature brain. And it is the most common physical disability in childhood, occurring in two to three per 1,000 live births in the developed countries of the United States, Canada, and Australia. And we know that it happens more in underdeveloped countries and in certain groups of children. Now, while it seems like it should be a straightforward diagnosis, as many of you know who care for these children, making this diagnosis is very challenging. And it was thought for a long time that in the first two years, this diagnosis was quote unquote si silent and that it really couldn't be made until there were um, further like motor, more advanced motor um, abilities that were clearly compromised, such as walking and running. But we now know that that is not the case. And in the average diagnosis currently has come down to 12 to 27 months. But um, in this area, we think that we can get it down even further and more consistently into the first year and maybe even less than six months. But the challenge comes from the fact that this condition is very dynamic in the first two years. Um, there are sometimes infants who will exhibit transient um, types of motor impairment and hypertonia. And so how do we parse that group of patients uh, from those who are going to develop cerebral palsy? But it is very important to make this diagnosis early because the brain has a neuroplasticity that we want to take advantage of and we want to be able to start our interventions as young as we can. And it has been shown that over 85% of parents actually suspect that their um, child has cerebral palsy before the diagnosis is given. So if we can shift that age of diagnosis down, we hopefully can reduce parental anxiety in conjunction with starting therapies that we hope could change the course of the condition. So why does cerebral palsy occur? What are some of the risk factors? Well, it's things that occur antenatally, perinatally, or postnatally. 
Um, and certainly preterm birth is one of the most important risk factors. Um, there are a variety of injuries that can happen to the brain. Um, you can see here um, an example of, of a neonatal stroke, um, which would put an infant at risk for hemiplegic CP, sometimes um, a generalized type of CP, and then periventricular leukomalacia um, as depicted there. So there are cystic types as in this picture and then non-cystic types. Um, so in this condition where we have ischemia um, of those periventricular areas that then lead to injury of the brain tissue and that necrosis can lead to those cysts. And unfortunately, that damage runs right through the corticospinal tracts that control um, motor um, areas. So, um, and of course, we also have things like HIE, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, where then we can see more of a, a generalized hit um, or hits to the basal ganglia areas. Now, for a third of children, the etiology is going to be unclear. Um, so unfortunately, um, that diagnosis of CP may come as quite a big surprise and shock um, for, for that family. So because not all children develop CP when they have injuries to their brain and we have um, this significant amount of children where we don't know what the factors are, um, we do think that there is an underlying genetic component. So here we see the different types of cerebral palsy, and for the um, majority of this talk, I'm going to be referring to spastic cerebral palsy as it makes up 70 to 80 percent of the types of CP that we see. Um, there are also dyskinetic and ataxic types, which differ based on the injury of the brain. Um, you can see in the shaded purple um, the affected um, areas of the body. Um, so really more in dyskinetic and ataxic, those patients have um, different types of movement as their name implies such as like athetoid type movements kind of writhing movements or they have issue, uh, great issues with balance and coordination but looking at spastic type, um, we will talk about patients who have a hemiplegic cerebral palsy where one side of the body, including the upper and lower extremity, um, is affected and versus diplegic cerebral palsy where the lower um, extremities are mostly affected um, in comparison to the upper. Um, hemiplegic is typically what we'll see in uh, stroke patients if it has been a unilateral stroke. Um, diplegic is more common in patients who have PVL. And then quadriplegic, um, where you have um, all of the areas of the body affected um, due to bilateral and pretty significant um, brain injury. There are different levels of cerebral palsy. They are classified based on the gross motor function classification system, which is the GMFCS levels one through five. Um, and I don't put all this up here necessarily to be memorized, but just to kind of show you um, the gradations that um, we can classify children in, mainly uh, distinguished between levels one and two being more ambulant uh, types of children, um, just needing minimal amounts of support versus three, four and five, where those patients have a lot more difficulty ambulating and they require use of walkers um, or wheelchairs. So now let's get into the early um, diagnosis um, and early intervention uh, recommendations that were put forth in 2017 by Dr. Iona Novak and a large group of researchers. And so what they wanted to do was they wanted to take the best evidence that was out there and create um, an international guideline on how we could go about um, accurately diagnosing cerebral palsy very early on. So this is the algorithm that they had constructed, um, and I know that it looks like a lot of uh, uh, different boxes, but we're going to take it um, kind of, you know, one step at a time. So the first important area is to look at your risk factors. So we talked about prematurity, um, encephalopathy. Um, there are other risk factors for cerebral palsy, like intrauterine growth restriction, congenital infections. Um, so we take those into account. And then if you have an older child, um, you would then uh, be on red alert if the parent identified a concern or that child was unable to sit by nine months or was exhibiting some hand asymmetry that might be indicative of developing like a hemiplegic type of CP. So um, importantly, this algorithm is only going to be for infants who have these risk factors. So that's where we're starting. 
And then after that, um, we are trying to look at three main areas. Kind of we have to check boxes in three main areas in order to give a patient a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. So along with that history of risk that hopefully we have established, then we need to prove that there is motor impairment. And we can do that using the tools like the HINE and the general movements, um, as well as a couple of other different tools that are listed. Um, and then we'd like to have abnormal imaging uh, to show that we do in fact have an injury to the brain. And so the gold standard for that would be MRI, but we are also able to take um, a head ultrasound if it has relevant pathology. So um, then it breaks into uh, evaluating patients based on their age. So if they are less than five months, um, corrected age, then we can use tools like the HINE and the general movement assessment along with the MRI. Um, if they are older than five months of age, then we have to shift to just using a HINE and an MRI. Um, the general movements, as I'll show you, kind of extinguish by the time um, that you are greater than five months, um, so we can no longer use that. So you see there um, that each of these um, each of these tools in their own right has high uh, um, levels of sensitivity um, and that if we use some of them um, together, such as MRI with just general movements alone, so not using it with a hind, we already achieve over a 95% accuracy. And then later on, if we have a hind and an MRI together, that will give us over a 90% accuracy in our diagnosis and false positives have been shown to occur at less than 5% of the time. Now in this diagram, you'll see that there are a variety of other, of other motor assessments. Some of them are uh, do have as high of sensitivity as the hind and the general movements. Um, some do not. Most of them have over 75%. Uh, we do not use all of these tools, um, and so they will not be my main focus today, um, but certainly tools that you might see used um, at other institutions. So let's talk specifically about Prechtel's general movement assessment. And this is Dr. Heinz Prechtel. Um, he was an Austrian uh, researcher. Um, he has since passed, but he had a lot of interest in uh, infant movements. Um, and he really felt that they were uh, patterned um, and purposeful. And so when he began um, doing this work in the 1970s and 1980s, he started taking videos of uh, rather well uh, preterm infants um, and would follow them for, you know, take a video for like an hour at a time and follow them weekly um, and really try to then review them and pull out um, any patterns. And he did in fact find them. Um, he then felt like these movements couldn't possibly just begin at birth, but that they also began um, during the pregnancy. And so once fetal ultrasound became more readily available in the 1980s, he then began uh, uh, looking at those movements um, for, again, like hours at a time, um, starting at about eight to nine weeks. So what he found was that at about seven and a half to eight weeks, um, there was movements um, that would begin and they uh, every single time would go through uh, the same stepwise fashion. So at seven and a half to eight weeks, the head started bending side to side. And then at nine to 10 weeks, this was really a key uh, period of time when he began seeing what he then would term the general movements. Um, and then those would refine themselves um, as the weeks went on. And then um, this would give way to isolated arm and leg movements, um, more complex head rotations and stretching, um, then sucking and swallowing and eye movements. And interestingly, as he followed these babies through um, term and beyond, um, what he found was that if you had an infant that was say, 30 weeks, born at 30 weeks, and you looked also at a woman who was pregnant at 30 weeks, the movements in that 30 week fetus were the same patterns as the movement of the baby who had been born um, and was now ex utero preterm. So these patterns were, were very, seemed very um, uh, kind of concretely made um, in the brain. 
So this is how he ended up categorizing all the patterns of movements that he saw, and we're going to walk through um, walk through these different categories. So the first category is writhing movements, which is again starting at that eight to nine week mark, um, and it's going to last until 46 to 49 weeks. Um, and this is categorized into normal writhing movements, poor repertoire, cramping, and chaotic movements. And after this writhing movement period, the movement actually transitions into what are called fidgety movements. And these fidgety movements will begin and overlap with the writhing movements, but the writhing movements will stop and all you'll have are fidgety movements um, until you get to about four to five months of age. And they peak in the two and a half to three month age mark. And so fidgety movements are going to be categorized as normal, absent, and abnormal. And once those fidgety movements um, uh, reach, you want to reach four to five months, they will then transition into voluntary and anti-gravity movements. So more purposeful movements um, like purposeful reaching um, and stepping and rolling over, et cetera. Um, so you can see that there is only um, this uh, relatively short window where we can see these movements and then we'll no longer be able to evaluate them. So how do we capture these movements? What we do is we record videos. Um, and so we record videos of infants when they are in the NICU, and then we follow them um, out into clinic um, when we have their visit at about two to three months and we're able to capture movements then. So it is a two to three minute video. The baby is on their back um, and in non-restrictive clothing, so that way we can see the upper and lower extremities clearly. Um, ideally, uh, they need to be asleep or in a quiet alert state. They cannot be crying or upset or too drowsy. We don't want a pacifier um, or they can't have hiccups or be distracted by any toys and we cannot touch them. Um, and the reason for that is because what we're interested in is really like the kind of baseline um, chatter and signals that the brain is sending to the body. So if any of those things are occurring at the same time, then it will disrupt um, kind of that, that baseline um, activity and that distraction will lead to other movements that um, will kind of confound uh, the movements that we're interested in. Now, interestingly, babies can be intubated when we take these videos, um, but we do need to be cognizant um, that they are not overly sedated. And when we watch these videos, um, we try to do this with uh, multiple uh, people who are certified in the GMA. Um, so we at least have two people evaluating and then a third if we need as a tiebreaker um, when we classify them. And when I show them to you, um, they will not be they will not have any sound. So uh, we take away the sound because we want to focus just on the movement. So we ourselves um, need to kind of take away that ambient um, um, noise um, to really hone in on the movement. So these are pictures of how the, Dr. Prechtel used to um, obtain these videos. So they had to set up, um, you know, a large tripod, large camera over the isolette. Um, we're very spoiled now in that we can just walk up to our isolette pretty easily or the, the crib and um, just take out our iPad um, and start video recording. Um, the most difficult thing that happens when we try to record these videos is that the baby might not be in uh, the best state to record the video. We try to do this during um, nursing care times um, and before anyone actually touches the baby. Um, and so uh, if they are not in a good state uh, for that two to three minutes, then we'll have to come back at another time. Um, then sometimes uh, some of our patients who have the more significant brain injuries and that we are most concerned about sometimes are quite irritable. Um, and so it can be really challenging to get a video that we feel is reliable. So now I'm going to take you through examples um, that we have obtained of these different categories of movement. So first we're gonna begin with the writhing uh, movement period and go through the four different categories. So first is normal writhing, and I'm gonna play this video a couple of times. Let me see if it, I can get it to work. 
So as I describe what's going on here, so in these normal writhing movements, um, the entire body is involved and it's really this like rich, complex movement where the arms and the legs and the trunk are all involved. And what you'll see is that um, a lot of times the it will start in the upper extremities. Um, you'll get kind of this wave that um, goes through at the beginning, maybe like kind of uh, bringing the hands around the lower part of the face. Um, and then it moves into the torso and you get kind of this ride, this S kind of shape that is made. And then it goes out through the feet. Um, and so it's as you can see, it's very fluid. It's very elegant. There's a lot of variability, so it's very difficult to predict um, what movements are going to be made by um, the patient um, versus, as I'll show you, with some other types um, of categories. Um, and these movements will be uh, disrupted with injury to the brain um, is what we see. So here in this patient, you can see that lovely, nice ride that he just did. He's bringing his hands up to his face um, and making these patterns um, over and over again. Now he is preterm, so it's not as mature um, as you might see in a term infant, um, but it's still uh, fairly complex. And there is some stretching that occurs. Um, there may be stretching that you see in between the movements. Um, that in and of itself is not necessarily part of normal, um, but just we look at the normal patterns that we see kind of underlying and in between those areas. So here is another baby. Um, this baby is intubated. Um, these are a little bit harder to see just because he's slightly restricted in his movement um, as he's a little bit tied to his ET tube, but his movements are not very predictable and he does um, make attempts to kind of lift his torso and right there and try to uh, kind of ride it through right there. He has a nice ride that goes um, and out the feet. So he did, we did call his um, as a normal writhing movement. Then there is poor repertoire and poor repertoire is considered an abnormal movement, um, but it's not necessarily indicative that a child is going to have cerebral palsy. Children may have a completely normal neurologic uh, neurodevelopmental outcome, but these movements are not as complex as uh, the normal writhing, as you'll see in this patient. They're rather simplistic, uh, rather monotonous. Sometimes it looks like it's going to go into a normal writhe, but then it kind of fizzles out and um, it kind of uh, is a little bit underwhelming uh, for the viewer um, and you're kind of left wanting more. And it's high, very predictable. Typically, the patterns of movement, they repeat themselves. Um, if you had to guess what the baby was going to do next, um, you could. So the fact that this baby is um, kind of bringing the arms up, bringing the legs up, um, it looks like maybe she's going to do a little bit more movement, but then she kind of stops and puts everything down. Um, and she really just does that over and over again. This is another example of poor repertoire um, in this baby who was a 25 weeker, now 37 weeks. And so there it looked like, oh, maybe he was going to lift up his arms, bring something through his torso and his legs and have a normal ride, but he did not. He, he stopped. Um, And these movements, uh, when we look at them, they do happen about every 15 to 20 minutes. So um, sometimes we do stand there for a while, just waiting for the baby to move um, to capture those couple of minutes that, that we get that movement. There he is again. He's kind of bringing his arms up, bringing his legs up. Oh, but it doesn't really go into more complex movements. Now that's in comparison to what is called cramped synchronized movements. And these are 
concerning movements. They are considered abnormal. They are very rigid movements. Um, here is a patient who has bilateral cystic PVL, and you can see right there, he tenses his entire body. So all the limbs and the trunk contract together, and then when they relax, they do so simultaneously. Now, you may think that you know, uh, you've, you've probably seen babies who have had kind of that tensing motion or perhaps they like bring up their legs and, and they kind of tense themselves. So that is not necessarily cramp synchronized movements. Um, what we're looking for is the whole body tensing up, as in this example, um, the trunk tensing up all at once and relaxing all at once, and the fact that it is occurring consistently. So um, so when you look at a baby's movements, if they have a lot of other movements going on, in addition to some of these contractions, we can't necessarily say that it is a fully cramp synchronized movement. So in this baby, for instance, you're just seeing a snippet here, but, um, but this is the movement that he was exhibiting for the entire three minutes of the video. If we um, see this cramping consistently over multiple weeks, then that is very highly predictive for spastic cerebral palsy. So for this baby, we did take another video two weeks later to, um, to see if the cramping continued, and in fact, it did. So you can see there his arms, his legs, again, tensing his um, abdomen, tensing as well. So then he rests, and then I believe he's going to have another one right there. Now, sometimes people worry that, you know, are we looking at potentially seizure activity um, and the vitals are all stable while this is happening. Um, you can see that he's, you know, very, he's quiet and in, in that quiet alert state. Um, and so, uh, it, but if you are concerned that it could be seizures, certainly you can get an EEG um, and you should not see um, any epileptic types of activity with um, these movements uh, when we're looking at general movements. And lastly, there are chaotic movements. Um, I actually don't have a video of this because chaotic movements are exceedingly rare. Um, and in the almost like 300 videos we've taken, we have not found a true chaotic movement. Um, but what happens in chaotic movements is that um, the limbs are all moving very abruptly in very large amplitudes. Um, they are not smooth whatsoever in their quality. Um, I kind of think of a baby who is very upset and they start kind of uh, moving their arms and legs like very erratically and very big, except for these babies, they are not upset. So they are calm and they are doing this. Um, these movements uh, usually happen for a short window and then they usually progress into cramp synchronized movements um, and, and they're very concerning if you see them. So that is the writhing movement period in a nutshell. Um, the next movements are going to be fidgeting movements. Um, and I should sit, have said too at the beginning that, um, and especially going into fidgety, which can be really hard to see, that um, I don't expect to make everybody experts um, in, in interpreting these videos. The uh, kind of point of going through them is to really expose you um, if you have not already been exposed to uh, the general movement assessment um, and, and to show you kind of the things that we're on the lookout for, um, what things could be concerning, and really hope Hopefully you can take away an idea of what is normal and what is very abnormal. So now we'll look at fidgety movements, um, which are in the three categories of normal, absent, and abnormal. And these are patients that we see in clinic at the two and a half to three month mark. So these movements, um, they can be very difficult to appreciate, but um, what we're looking for is kind of like little ticking movements. Um, and so what we look at areas in the wrists and in the ankles, um, we're also looking in the shoulders um, and in the hips to see if they kind of like basically wiggle a little bit. Um, they are described as um, these movements being variable in their acceleration. Um, they are continual while the patient is awake. They go away when the patient is asleep um, and they can occur in any position. So we do have them lay down while we capture these videos so we can just see them better. 
but we can even see them if a mother um, is holding like her child, um, they will continue. Now there are big movements that might happen, um, like kicking of the feet or moving of the arms. The child may even bring their arms together. But what we're looking for are these very fine, subtle movements that are seen um, in between or while those are ongoing. So for this child, you can see, and if you look at his wrist, they kind of, uh, he brings his hands together and he has very tiny little movements that happen there. Um, he's a pretty good example if you focus in on his feet, um, that he's kind of like the ankles of his feet have these little uh, kind of fidgety ticks in them. Um, and so I, and, and his hips do move just a little bit as well. So we try and when we're looking, see right there, he kind of pushed his foot down, his left foot down a little bit. So when we look at them, we really try when they start kicking to kind of push that noise out of the way and see if the fidgets come through. So right there, he also had a little bit of fidgeting in his, in his feet as well. And there he's also continues to fidget his feet. Again, just focus in at those ankles and the wrists are probably the best places to see it. Now we're not looking in the toes. Sometimes you do see little toe movements, but that doesn't really count. This is another patient. He has pretty good um, like upper extremity fidgets, but he does fidget quite a bit in his feet. He's already starting to do it. Um, so I'm just gonna, he does have those toe movements I talked about. So just try to ignore those, but look at his ankles. Um, you see him fidgeting and kind of rotating um, the wrist there. And so that can happen. They can grab things and still um, fidget as well. So this is a movement that we want to see. Um, so that means that a child um, is very unlikely to develop cerebral palsy if we see these fidgeting movements. So the, the connections in the brain are, um, are kind of set up as, as you would hope that they would be. Now that's in comparison to what is called absent fidgety. So it's when those fidgety movements cannot be seen. And so um, to me, it's it's basically like radio silence, um, or if you think of like a still calm lake. Um, so those little vibrations of movement just do not exist. Um, so first in this video on the left is going to be the baby I showed you earlier who had that cramp synchronized movement. And so here he is, um, and if you look at his, like in his ankles or in his wrists, you see that it's just, none of that's happening. Um, it's just very still. Um, and you can probably gauge too by looking at him that he looks quite stiff. Um, but that stiffness is not necessary um, to categorize patients in the absent fidgety. Um, so that just happens to be his case. And then this is a baby who um, has HIE, um, uh, had therapeutic hypothermia, also uh, was complicated by seizures. And so you can see that he is a little less stiff than our other patient. Um, he is making the, a lot of movements in his legs um, and kind of moving his arms a little bit side to side. But when we're trying to focus to see if we see those fine fidget movements, um, we don't, we don't see those in there. So absent fidgety is uh, very concerning um, as it is highly predictive for significant impairment, um, specifically cerebral palsy. And then we have lastly, abnormal fidgety, and this is a uh, very rare, um, what it looks like is if you had a hard time seeing fidgety, um, this is like an exaggerated fidgety. So if you took fidgety and like really turned the volume up on it, that is what we see here. So for instance, in this patient's um, feet, they are kind of making those small little um, kicks, if you will, or rotations at the ankles um, that we can see pretty clearly because it's too much. Um, and then with her arms, she tends to move them like side to side um, in, in kind of this exaggerated pattern as well. So when we see that, um, we categorize it as abnormal fidgety. And we've only had about two patients um, who've had abnormal fidgety. 
We don't know a lot about abnormal fidgety. Um, it tends to happen in patients who have BPD, as this patient had, um, can be associated with mild neurological deficits, coordination issues, um, or ADHD, and um, interestingly, defiance um, later on in life. Um, so, and it can be associated with cerebral palsy, but it, it's not very strongly indicative of that. Um, this patient did end up having a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, um, but that's not necessarily the case for all. So again, you can kind of see her moving her ankles and her feet again. Uh, and she's calm uh, during all of this. So this is not because of distress. Um, she is in a calm state and these are just normal movements that she has at this time. So when we look, uh, when researchers have looked at what cramp synchronized movements um, imply and what the other types of movements imply, um, this is what they have found. So um, in this graph here, when uh, Ferrari and his group and his team looked at infants who had normal writhing um, or very consistently poor repertoire or predominantly cramp synchronized movements, what they found was that if you were normal writhing, then you are more you are going to have a normal outcome. Um, if you have poor repertoire consistently, um, which I would, you know, the majority of our patients are, especially our preterm population, have a consistent poor repertoire, the majority of them are going to have a normal outcome. But there are some who will have some mild motor impairments. And then it's really when you get into that predominantly um, and consistently cramp synchronized movements that you look you see the moderate to severe impairment. And so for them in their group of patients, um, these patients who had cramp synchronized consistently de uh, tended to then progress to absent fidgety and they develop cerebral palsy. And they also found that the earlier the cramp synchronized movements appeared, then the worse the outcome would be. Um, and so usually we'll start, we can start evaluating for these movements at about two weeks after the injury. So if you're already seeing them that early, then that would be uh, concerning. This is what Prechtel found for the progression of uh, general movements. Um, and so uh, looking in the, the first um, two columns here at the percent of patients who exhibited the dif different categories of general movements and then how they progressed in their neurodevelopmental outcomes, you can see that again, if you're a normal, the majority as shown by this large arrow progress to a normal fidgety and then have normal outcomes. If you have poor repertoire, that's a little bit of a mixed bag. You're not always sure which direction you're going to go, but the majority will be normal fidgety and have a normal outcome. But some will be absent fidgety, um, and then that would indicate and they, these children did have cerebral palsy. And then you can see in black the cramps synchronized very largely uh, moving towards absent fidgety and then cerebral palsy. So now I'm going to shift away from the general movement assessment and talk about the HINE or the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Exam. And this is different than the Hammersmith Neonatal Exam. Um, but both were developed by Dr. Lily Dubowitz, who um, was a pediatrician, and her and her husband did a lot of work um, in the area of neurodevelopment. Um, and so they uh, she created this um, uh, assessment um, that can has been validated to be done between three and 18 months of age, but many um, use it between two and 24 months of age. It is uh, 26 items that are divided into five areas, and I'm going to show them to you. Um, they're divided into cranial nerve function, posture, quality and quantity of movement, muscle tone, and reflexes and reaction, and you can score from zero to 78. There are score cutoffs by age, as you can see in the box on the right. Um, and so if you fall below those score cutoffs, then that is considered an abnormal exam and, and we would be concerned. Uh, we also take into account asymmetries. Um, some of the items are divided into right and left. Um, and so if you have more than five asymmetries, that would also uh, be concerning. So um, here is what uh, our assessment, the assessment um, looks like. Um, and it takes about uh, like five minutes, really, once you get quite proficient in it um, to perform. Um, and you'll see some things that are uh, probably familiar to you, um, like the scarf sign, popliteal angles um, uh, that we do. And you can see here that the R's and the L's indicate those items that we are going to be looking for asymmetries. 
So some of the things we do is we, um, for instance, look at the ability to track um, with the eyes in an arc. Um, we look at their um, auditory uh, uh, Kind of response um, to a rattle or something like that. Um, and then we're going to assess their tone in all of these different ways, uh, various maneuvers for the upper extremities and the lower extremities. Um, we'll put them in different types of suspensions. Um, and then we will look at their posture. So we'll bring the, the patient into sitting position and see how well they can maintain that and what their head and their arms and legs look like. So um, these are going to be uh, videos as I don't have videos of myself performing the exam, but um, these are videos of a neurologist um, from Italy, Dr. Gusetta, who does a lot of work in early detection of cerebral palsy, um, just to show you what a couple of items look like. So this is going to be the scarf sign and uh, passive elevation of the arm. This is a patient um, who does not have a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, um, so is neurotypical, and you'll see that he can very easily um, do the scarf sign and uh, bring that arm up overhead. So this patient would receive uh, normal scores for those items um, and would not have any asymmetries. This is in comparison to this child who has hemiplegia, and you can see that arm closest to us, and the screen is quite tight. So that scarf sign was very difficult to um, elicit. And when he tries to lift up the arm, that arm is not, it's, it's very resistant um, to its effort, to his efforts. So that patient is going to have um, a lower score on that item and will receive um, an asymmetry marking. And then this is an item called arm protection where we lift the child up and see what the arm that you are not holding on to, we see what it does. So you'll see right here that the arm he is not holding on to, which is closest to you, um, it, it puts itself all the way down um, and is outstretched. And that's what we want. And so here, um, that is not going to happen for this patient. You can see she kept her right arm very tight to her body. Um, and so, uh, so again, she would be um, have a lower score on that um, and would have another asymmetry. So uh, what is important on the hind is that um, actually when we score it, um, I had shown you those cutoffs before. Um, so sometimes you can have normal scores if one part of the body is compensating. So that's why those asymmetries are something that we really have to be attuned to, because if the child has asymmetries from right to left and a normal score, we may still have hemiplegia um, at play. Or if we have um, normal scores in the upper extremities and uh, lower scores in the lower extremities, we could get a normal score, um, but we need to be cognizant of that because that may be more consistent with a diplegic picture. The hind is really nice because we can use it to track abnormalities in those first two years, and we can categorize then um, spasticity as being persistent or just being transient. Um, at three to six months, if we have a very low hind score, less than 40, it has been shown in studies that that is associated with um, non-ambulant, more severe types of CP levels three to five versus um, scores that are 40 to 60 are more consistent with levels one to two, and that patient can ambulate. Um, then this is a study by Romeo, um, as well as Dr. Gusetta um, in 2008, um, looking at using the hind in conjunction with your GMA and specifically looking at it in that fidgety uh, time frame. So you can see in this first table, um, they show what happens when you have normal fidgety and abnormal fidgety and the outcomes of normal mild disability, hemiplegia, diplegia, or um, Tetra, what they term tetraplegia, and if you have absent fidgety paired with a hind over 50 versus a absent fidgety paired with a hind less than 50, in that last category, you're more likely to have a significant type of cerebral palsy. And then when they looked at the correlation between outcomes and each of these assessments, um, looking at general movements, hind, ultrasound, or pairing the general movements with the hind, they found the strongest correlation to neurological outcome being no CP or CP, um, that that was, uh, this last one had the strongest. So at three months, the sensitivity and specificity is quite high. 
um, 94% and above for detecting cerebral palsy when you use these two tools together. So going back to this algorithm, um, you may have asked yourself, well, what happens if I don't have all of these criteria? What if maybe I know that there's a motor impairment, but maybe I don't have an MRI or a head ultrasound that is showing me pathology? Um, and perhaps you don't have the strongest of risk factors. Well, in that case, um, we won't diagnose the patient as having cerebral palsy yet, and instead we can give them this uh, diagnose, diagnostic term um, that is high risk for cerebral palsy. And that is very specific. It is not uh, to be confused with, it's not to be the same as high risk for neurodevelopmental delays. Um, it is very specifically that we are concerned this patient could have cerebral palsy, but we're in a little bit of a limbo phase. Um, and so while we're trying to parse that out, we still want to get that patient into interventions um, because the patient could have cerebral palsy, but clearly has motor impairments um, that we would like to um, help them with. Um, and then we can wait until their next assessment, which is going to be that HINE, um, and see if they are still falling below the cutoff and we're still concerned um, or if they are not. And we may or may not transition them to then a diagnosis of cerebral palsy. So what do we do in our follow-up program? So we have taken the GMA videos into the NICU. Um, we are currently looking at uh, preterm infants um, who are 33 weeks or less, 1,500 grams or less than anyone with um, neurological conditions that put them at risk for CP. We try to get two videos. The first video is at 34 to 36 weeks corrected age. Um, and then the second video we try to get before discharge or at the 40-week uh, mark. And if we do see that cramp synchronized or if someday see chaotic movements, then we repeat that GMA two weeks later because of that strong association with CP if it is consistent. And if we don't have a head ultrasound um, that has relevant pathology for an infant who has cramp synchronized or chaotic movements, um, then right now we are recommending um, an MRI to the medical team. When we move to the clinic, we then repeat a video at two and a half to three months um, and, and do that in conjunction with a hind. Um, we're looking for that fidgeting movement. If we see it and the hind is normal, then we will uh, wait to see that patient until 12 months of age. Um, and if it is abnormal um, in either uh, tool that we use, then we uh, that patient is getting a diagnosis of likely high risk for cerebral palsy, but we could be making a diagnosis of cerebral palsy at that visit, um, and we're referring for services, and then we are seeing them back about three months later to do the HINE again um, and determine the direction we're going to take, and then they will be seen at one year corrected. So here's a couple of cases of patients that we have had, so you can kind of see how we put this to use. So this first case is a child who was born at 38 and five uh, sevenths weeks, um, was a female who uh, had, a, there was a stat C-section for decreased fetal movement and non-reassuring fetal heart tones. And the MRI was abnormal with bilateral cerebral deep white matter diffusion consistent with hypoxic ischemic changes. Um, and interestingly, this patient only needed a NICU stay of 15 days. Um, so she recovered, um, was on room air, and um, was taking everything by mouth. And here are her videos. So the first one. You can see here that um, she she's trying to move. We see a little bit of um, movement in the torso kind of pushing up. Um, but as we kind of wait to see if it's going to become more complex, it does not. So she mostly does that limited amount of movement every time uh, she makes attempts at moving. Um, you can see there she's kind of trying to push up again, um, kind of on her heel. Um, but definitely not that like really uh, rich, complex movement, not bringing hands around the face, not seeing like rise all through the torso and through the legs. It's just 
kind of um, simplistic, um, simple in its movements. Um, and so we did call uh, that that video as a poor repertoire movement. And then when we saw her in clinic, this is her video. And you can see that she has a lot of like big movements in her feet, in her legs, in her lower extremities. She's kind of, you know, bringing her arms like back and forth. But if you're looking at her ankles and having a hard time seeing those subtle movements that I was telling you about, um, that's because they are not there. So this patient, um, her video was read as an absent fidgety. And she does this the entire time. So this is just a snippet of this video, but she's just kind of, she kicks her legs down a lot like that, um, very repetitively over and over again. Um, she kind of is able to move her body. Um, so you might think, oh, am I seeing like fidgets in the hips? But it's really just the large movements of the legs that are causing her to, to kind of shift over a little bit. So she had a hind at that time um, and it was 52 and she had three asymmetries. The cutoff uh, for that is 57, so she did fall below that. So she does have an abnormal MRI. She has um, a concerning history and she has um, abnormal uh, GMA and hind. So at that time, technically, we could have called her uh, as having a diagnosis of cerebral palsy, um, but this was early on um, as we were adopting these different tools. And so we took a conservative approach and we uh, waited until the next visit. Um, after referring her for services. She was supposed to come back in six months, but unfortunately couldn't make it back until the 12 month visit. And so the hind at that time was 59.5 and she had four asymmetries. So it was still below the cutoff. And her Bailey at that time was in line with that. She had a significant gross motor delay. And so we did give her a diagnosis of cerebral palsy at that time. And we referred her to uh, physical medicine and re rehabilitation. For this second case, this is a baby who was born at 32 weeks and four days. Mom had preterm labor. Um, this is a female who had a 20-day NICU stay. It was pretty uncomplicated. Um, I don't have her NICU video to show you, but I can tell you that um, it was poor repertoire. So similarly, like our prior patient. And this is her video when she came to see us in clinic. So I would focus a lot on her feet there. You can already see that she uh, is making very like subtle little uh, flicks in her ankles, um, even though it cuts off a little bit. Um, so already she's making little fidgety movements. And she has very subtle ones in her wrists, like right there, she kind of moves her, her left wrist a little bit, um, but I do think those are harder to see. Um, and she has very slight movements too in her um, shoulders as well. But again, focusing on the feet, you can tell, even though she's wearing uh, pants, uh, which I will say we should have removed, um, but that's all right. We can still see that she has those little fidgets um, there. So uh, along with that, that uh, GMA video, she had a hind of 53 and two asymmetries that was below the cutoff. So we did say that she was high risk for cerebral palsy and we referred her for physical therapy. And then when we saw her back at six months, um, she had a 69 and zero asymmetries on her hind, which was improved. And at one year, her Bailey was all normal. So um, we see this type of case uh, pretty um, cons uh, frequently. Um, and so we'd like to, to think um, that even though this is likely a, a transient um, type of uh, hypertonia that's, that's going on, that getting these patients still into services early can help them overcome that uh, more quickly um, and, and then make way for them to meet their milestones. So what is the future of early detection? 
Well, a lot of people are working to um, build even more intensive GMA interpretation. So today I kind of gave you a taste of what um, GMA interpretation looks like, um, but right now there um, are, are kind of almost checklists uh, that break down each of those categories. So you can almost look at each one of those, albeit poor repertoire, cramp synchronized, um, the fidgeties, and really dissect them even further. Um, there are people who are mapping um, these movements. So you can see down here in the corner what probably looks like a starry night sky. That's a researcher who is trying to map um, these babies' uh, movements um, and so trying to use uh, higher levels of technology to interpret these movements. Um, so can we classify them? Do, will we pull out new patterns of movements that we don't already know are there? Um, will they tell us uh, with even more specificity that a child is going to develop this particular type of cerebral palsy? Um, so that's kind of something that is uh, we're all like waiting um, to see what happens. Um, and can we de decrease the age of diagnosis even further? So I've shown you today that we can do this, um, you know, we've done it consistently at the six to nine month mark. Um, that one child already was meeting criteria at three months, which is very early on. But can we more consistently make that diagnosis at three months? Can we shift it down into even the NICU period? Um, so those are things that uh, we all are questioning. And with this uh, new diagnosis being so early, um, what are we going to do about it? Um, what are the interventions that we can recommend to families? Um, if I know a child has cramps synchronized in the NICU consistently, what should I do for that child? What should I tell my therapy team to do? Um, so we don't know, but there is a lot of research that is ongoing to try and figure that out because we know that it is the next step. Um, and our I think everybody's main goal is to try and diagnose this early so we can get uh, children functioning at their highest potential. These are uh, my conclusions for the talk. Um, so I'm not going to go through each of them, but I hope that I have imparted upon you this morning that it is very important to identify children who uh, have cerebral palsy or those who are at high risk for cerebral palsy early on so we can initiate interventions as soon as possible and support the family. And I really encourage you, if you don't already, um, when you examine patients, really try and take a moment, just take two minutes um, before you put your hands on a baby um, to see what their movements are. Um, not necessarily because you're going to categorize them as we've talked about today, but it can really give you a lot of information about um, what, their, what their brain is doing. Um, and so I know before I learned all of this, I very much um, would unswaddle a patient and go right to listening them and touching them and moving them. And really, I have definitely shifted my practice into just taking a moment and see kind of what their movements are telling me. So lastly, I'd like to thank um, a couple of teams um, who have made all of this possible. Um, our premier team, um, who is led by Dr. Alice Gong. Um, so she really, uh, before I came on, had already gotten this ball rolling in early detection, um, and we're all kind of just running with it. Um, so um, all of these uh, ladies work very hard to obtain uh, these GMA videos on our patients um, and also provide the services that our patients need. Um, um, and then, of course, our therapy team who has come into the picture in the last year to help us obtain these GMAs, they have just been instrumental, especially in those complex patients, because they can get them really nice and calm and, and we can get the information we need and then uh, they can provide uh, interventions for them as well. And I'll just leave this here. It's just one last plug for our upcoming uh, premiere reunion party. Um, hopefully you guys can come out and make it on a Monday night to celebrate with us um, and our NICU graduates. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Diedrich, we, we do have a couple questions in the chat and I will read them out to you. Um, the first question comes from Dr. Michael Wassef. He says, many of our NICU babies already have continuous video stream set up, the angel eye that parents use to um, see their baby. Uh, is it possible to use these video streams with parental consent for a more consistent analysis, possibly combined with machine learning or AI as an adjunct to provider assessment? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. Um, so, 
There's a couple of barriers, I think, with using the angel eye. Um, you're right, it is a continuous stream. Um, the quality of the picture is not as good, I think, as when we are able to use like our iPads. Um, uh, and then the other issue too is um, that a lot of babies are swaddled in between their cares. Um, and so we, you know, cannot see movements, um, obviously, when they are swaddled. So that would entail like a culture shift of really unswaddling them um, and leaving them open um, and then uh, recording the videos that way. Um, so so I, I think it, and we don't know. We don't know for sure, right? If swaddling is truly is is it um, hindering those movements, um, those normal movements or not? Um, so uh, so yeah, so something to potentially look into, but I think that there are a couple of uh, difficulties uh, kind of going that route. And there's one other question in the chat and one hand up. So the question in the chat from Dr. Meyer is, can you comment on how pain affects the rise? Does it increase or decrease it? And also, what is the association with congenital heart disease and abnormal movements? Those two questions. Okay, so I think I heard the first was about pain. Is that correct? Yes. So yes, so I think um, if a baby is in pain, it can disrupt the ride. So we don't want the baby to be in pain. Um, I can tell you too, I've also been, um, a, I don't know the answer for this question of, uh, I have some children who have really significant reflux, um, like constantly are refluxing and arching, and I don't know how it affects their rides. So sometimes I can see cramping in those patients, but I'm not sure if it's the reflux or if it's truly um, the brain and the cramping. Um, and so, so yeah, so to answer that question, uh, the pain will disrupt it. Um, the congenital heart disease question is also a really good question. Um, so I do not know uh, uh, the that population has not been specifically studied. Um, and uh, there's actually a lot of populations that haven't been studied. The other one that I think of is like neonatal abstinence syndrome, because uh, we actually do take videos of those babies um, uh, from our uh, used in like our follow-up clinic as well. So uh, so we're, we want to look into what that shows. Um, but yes, certainly children with congenital heart disease, um, that's an untapped area, would be challenging, obviously, because of the surgeries that they undergo um, and balancing uh, that uh, them being in a, in a calm state, I think, um, and not in pain um, to try and capture those movements and see what their um, neurological outcomes are. Dr. Manamuk, do you want to ask your question and then probably we should close out after that because we are at 8.30. Hello? Hey, <laughs> I can hear you. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi, Leslie Ann. Um, I was wondering from a general pediatric perspective, right, if these babies are not following up in the premier clinic, for instance, like the late preterms or the full term kids don't always go there, they come to us. Um, a couple of questions. One is like, we're not gonna have the skills or the time to do all the scoring. Um, how would you recommend that we do screenings for these babies in our clinics? Um, and at what age do we start, you know, really looking at them closely? And then the second question is like, if we see abnormals, like the absent fidgety or something, just to our eye um, and we want to make referrals, what kind of a diagnosis do you attach to that referral? Because it's not exactly developmental delay that, you know, would qualify them for services, maybe abnormal movement or something. Right. Um, so, uh, so yes, yeah, so you are correct in identifying that we do have this population of babies, like even for us who are over, um, you know, 34 weeks and over um, that we are not currently recording. So some units 
do have the some like very large units would have the resources to record all of their patients. Um, I would love to do that, but right now uh, that's uh, not feasible. So we've tried to target, um, you know, the higher risk population, but I, I don't know what's going on um, necessarily for those bigger babies. Um, and then when when you see them you know, I, I think certainly if there is um, a history that you might be a little bit uh, worried about in conjunction with the examination of the baby, um, things that you might be worried about, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, if they are at that age at this two and a half um you know, to three month age when you see them, which is where we anticipate these fidget movements should peak. Um, you know, you can always take like a two minute video and then have us take a look at it. Or if you're just concerned in general, um, yes, you could uh, then refer us um, and and potentially tack on like abnormal movements. But I think probably I think most likely the best thing to do is if you can capture that video um, and we can see it, then that would be great. Um, we uh, interestingly, there is some work being done on like kind of can we apply this like virtually uh, because we did implement the using the GMA and the Hine virtually with our patients during COVID. So in a couple of those videos, you probably noticed those patients were not in the clinic. They were actually like in their homes. Um, and so we were still able to make these assessments. Um, uh, so, you, you know, people can even like, I guess, call us up, right? Like any of those kind of telehealth visits or telehealth consults, um, and we can take a look. Because if you can give us like an age and a history and we can see those movements, then we could um, kind of guide you further. Thank you so much, Dr. Dietrich. Thank you. So everyone, please join me in thanking Dr. Dietrich again. And if you didn't get it yet, um, the code is in the chat. All right, thank you.